for for 30 years who holds the shop together. Okay, so you can put it there. Okay, so where do we get it? Yeah, don't worry. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, now about Rome. Uh, can we do these people know that I have to deliver on on the 8th or the 9th? I can uh, email Stefano. Okay. Sure yeah. Either or. You're leaving on the 10th, right? I have to leave on the 10th. And I'm going to try to catch that same flight. So, uh -huh. if you're both leaving on the 10th, then okay. I'll ask them if we can present on the 8th or the 9th. Right. Yeah. That will be good. Okay. Very good. Okay, let's start our. Oh, here we want to look into fascism today. So, we have. We want to look at a few scenes. So, you can put it down. And. Uh, then Dustin can help us in our struggle. Okay, what do we have here? Uh, okay, let's see, we have some contemporary issues. Let's start out with that. Now, first of all, we want to start out. Is it warm enough? Is it too warm? What do you think? So we have uh, discourse number, where are we today, so that we do it orderly, I think it's discourse number 7, discourse number 7, and uh, anything about discourse number 6, anything we said the last time, which we should repeat once more, uh, so today it's dialectical and positivistic method, thank you. Do you have something to drink? Do you have something to eat? Very good. Okay, do we have anything about discourse number six? Um, I think we read this. Uh, we, we looked at Freud's piece on anxiety, and we looked at the um, id, the ego, the superego, the environment. We saw some uh, opposition of Freud to philosophy. Philosophy was something like a Baedeker, a travel uh, guide, and um, so there was some criticism, and this reaches further into from and um, also into, uh, I think, into the whole critical theory. But when you read this one, this book there on the crisis in psychoanalysis, there uh, uh, from attacks Marcuse, and that is very strange because they were good friends originally. They worked together in at Columbia University, and from admired him always because of his philosophical orientation and so on. He wrote uh, Marcuse wrote a book on Hegel, and uh, then again at the end a book on Hegel and uh, one on Heidegger and so on. So he was a great philosopher. But then in the fifties, there was some unbelievable struggle coming up between them. And that is reflected in that book, uh, Crisis of Psychoanalysis. And the struggle is about that, that Marcuse has misunderstood Freud. And he has misunderstood Freud because he looked at him philosophically. And what is missing is the empirical. That means um, Marcuse is not empirical. Marcuse does not make analysis with real patients. He has no clinical experience. And so Fromm emphasizes his own clinical experience of 20 years, 25 years in New York with real people on the couch and so on, and that is all missing with Marcuse. And therefore, Marcuse is philosophical, is speculative, and there misunderstands Freud. So there is something about science and philosophy. And there, this reminds us of Kant, remember? Kant is the inventor of the word positivism and the inventor of the word sociology. And he was almost at the time of Hegel, so he considered himself still to be a philosopher. And he had this uh, scheme that there was first a religious um, type of period in, in uh, the existence of the human species, then there was a philosophical period, and then there was a scientific period. And um, so uh, the, uh, the positivistic point of view the negation of one of the other is uh, an abstract one. That means uh, philosophy just throws out of the world uh, religion. Now people have become rational 
and myth and so on is repressed. So then comes science, and science kicks out a philosophy. Philosophy is no good anymore, and so on. And you find that attitude on our campus among students very often. It's in sociology where they say, well, this is philosophy, and we don't have anything to do with philosophy. We are now science, and we have philosophy left behind. So what we can do from the critical theory point of view is to dialecticize Kant. That means to say, yes, you are right, there were these periods, but every new period supersedes concretely and not abstractly the previous one. That means philosophy still has theological or religious elements in itself. So when you read Plato and Aristotle, you see there are a lot of old myths are present there. They, they become symbolical then, but um, religion remains present in, uh, in philosophy. And then when we have, after Hegel, the transition to science, sci uh, philosophy is not just kicked out the door, but philosophy is something which is concretely superseded. That means science has in itself also still uh, mythical elements, and it still also has philosophical elements in itself. So Fromm's dialectic is not so different from the Hegelian one. The, um, as we saw the last time, the relationship between the id and the uh, ego and the superego is a dialectical one. The ego negates the id, the will to life, with its libidinous forces and its aggressive forces. Um, and so the, the Freud calls this negation repression or suppression and so on. That is the process of negation. Ego negates it, otherwise ego could not even develop. So as ego develops, it differentiates itself from the it and represses the it, but not um, abstractly. Now, that is very Hegelian, but in a concrete way. That means the it is still the source of energy for the ego. And if you have a neurotic, the horrible thing with the neurotic is that he has no energy. He's tired all the time, and, and so on, because too much energy is used to repress the ego instead of having a clear uh, flow of energy coming out of the uh, out of the id. So, um, and then we have the same thing in the superego. The superego contains the great ideas like Trinity and, and so on, or the great ethical ideas, the golden rule. So, that isn't the superego. In the superego, in a certain sense, also um, negates the both of them, negates the id, and it negates the ego at the same time. When the ego acts against the norms in the superego, then the superego bites the ego, because the superego gets the aggression from the id, and applies the aggression against the ego. So then you feel bad inside that you have done this, you repent, I wish I hadn't done this, and so on, and uh, it is inside, and it's a miserable feeling, it's a ditter, which the superego puts on the ego. So, um, and so we can say that the ego is the center, logically, it's the middle part between the id and the ego. So as the center, it has to mediate between the id and the ego, and also the requirements of the environment outside, which are imposed. So. The ego is the great mediator, or logically you could say that the it is the principle. That is where everything comes from. From there the ego is differentiated, from there the superego is differentiated, from there the, the energy comes, and so on. The, um, the ego is the middle term, and the superego is the goal. So that means that's where people are striving for, to become good people, to transcend the environments into which the animal is captured. That's why Schelling and these people think that there's something, and St. Paul too, that there's something wrong with nature, that nature is sad and is depressed because the animals, and more even the plants, are caught up in their environments. What are these environments? Well, it's the food that they come all the time. You can't just fed them out there. So um, they, they are the food, the eating stuff, and then the sex stuff, sex stuff, the genus process, the reproduction of the species, and then the location where they are, the nest or the cave where the little uh, things are hiding in winter and so on. So the, the, the animal cannot transcend, it cannot break out those environments. The animal has no world. Man alone, through language and so on, can establish, can open up, can reveal world beyond these uh, 
environments. Now, there are people who are not well developed and educated and so on, though they get stuck in these environments like animals do. That is when Marx then curses and that capitalism means the regression, you know, into the when people still lived in caves or so. So the tenement houses were caves where people were crawling into in the most primitive way. So what capitalism is doing to people is that it keeps them on the animal level. That means it keeps them worrying so much about food and then about sex and then about the enemy and so on that they cannot transcend this. So thinking is transcending, then Bloch would define it, right? So that men suddenly, what happened in maybe 200,000 years ago, we became aware of ourselves, we developed the consciousness of ourselves, and then only later on there were names and so on and so on. So um, it happened in our brain, you could approach it from the brain thing, something happened which was not the case in all the other mammals around us, not even in the chimpanzees and so on, namely this ability to transcend. And that goes also into the definition of the critical theories of religion. They think that man becomes human at the moment when he can, slow, can long for the totally other than just his body and the cave and the enemy and the sex partner and the food. Now, capitalism puts millions of people who depend on food stamps and uh, unemployment compensation and minimum wage and so on, puts them practically into an animal situation. So that then man, Marx would say in the Abitur already uh, writing, that man then is the only being who does not reach his destination. Capitalism prevents people from reaching their destination, particularly by feeding them uh, uh, images, images which awaken certain needs which they don't even have, and uh, so they get involved in this type of an idolatry that is then what, what Marx called this um, idolatry as a commodity, commodity fetishism. Commodity fetishism is commodity idolatry. That means like the old gods, men make them, men have a piece of wood, and then half of them they burn, the other half they make into a god. But this god has eyes and doesn't see, and has ears and doesn't hear, and so on. And it is a part of their own making as our cause, which we put up then and we uh, uh, admire them, and we spend our lives there to build them and to pay for them and so on, so they become our gods. That is why then uh, sociologists, and who is it there in Heidelberg, the Weber, Max Weber, would say that the civil society is polytheistic. And in our Monday night there, where the Pope says that it's, this is uh, the idolatry of money, and the money is the universal commodity, which can stand for all commodities, therefore it is the highest uh, type of commodity fetishism is money fetishism. That means money idolatry. Okay? So that's what we want to say the last time. And so the controversy between uh, Fromm and Marcuse uh, goes back to an ambiguity in Freud himself. A certain contradiction. Because Freud, as we said, you know, makes somehow fun of uh, philosophy, they know everything, you know, they have this totality view, and uh, they have a guide for life, and so on, and we scientists, we are humble, and we work on little details, and that is the only way how one can get any wisdom, and so on. But then, when he discovers clinically, empirically, the death drive, he says, and now we are back in the camp of Schopenhauer. Well, Schopenhauer is a philosopher, after all. And by the way, Schopenhauer himself was not hostile to science, like Hegel was not hostile to science. Schopenhauer expressively said, and we, uh, he wanted to study the natural sciences specifically in order to understand the will to life better and so on. And so Hegel has no bad word against the scientists, or that they are stupid or whatever. But whatever new scientific things have developed in, in cosmology, in uh, geography and physics and chemistry of his time, he was the best read man. He had all that literature and he quotes it. You can see this in the logic and you can see it in the encyclopedia. The first part of the encyclopedia is the logic, the second part is philosophy of nature, and the philosophy of nature are all the modern scientists of the scientific revolution of the 18th century. They are all there. Chemists and so on, all these details. So, uh, And we have that in Form 2 on one side 
uh, he emphasizes science and he says that Marcuse there uh, he uh, is, is uh, somehow speculative but on the other hand their whole friendship rested on, uh, on Fromm's admiration that, uh, that Marcuse was such a great philosopher and there, where, where does Fromm uh, end up with not only with the philosopher but with the theologian namely with uh, uh, Meister Eckhart Meister Eckhart whom he has in that last book Having and Being and there was this thing which uh, which should be true there Dustin and I experience we, we put an article there in a book about Fromm and so I mentioned that X experience and it sounded as if they had never heard of it or and then I said something about the city of being as if they had never heard of it so they asked us again to show where it is and not only that they took it out and put it into the article so this is very 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 peculiar so but so nevertheless it is this controversy between science and philosophy and we can say when we dialecticize court we can say that yes science negates this science uh, concentrates on the trees and is distrustful of the forest so when religious people come and are holistic philosophers are holistic then the scientists said you know this we have to deal with the tree we have to do these little things we have to study that little fly and the right wing of that little fly when it flies over the North Pole and so on. They, the sacrificial thing of the scientist is that he sacrifices his whole life for something which the everyday person doesn't even see or is not interested in or whatever. And it is these very detailed studies, like my Uncle Albin there, I mentioned him, spent his whole life to get that wing there backward, you know. But it is those little things and which force the philosopher and the theologian to change their, their thing. And Tillich made it very clear that if the scientists have discovered, um, let's see, heliocentrism, heliocentrism like uh, Copernicus and so on, or like Darwin, if they have enough evidence, then the religious person has no right whatsoever to resist this now. He has to change his view now and has to find some kind of an adaptation. And so it is very unknown, it really doesn't happen anywhere else than here with our monkey trial and so on. Nobody else had a monkey trial. It was true that you know, in, in Great Britain, the uh, Anglican Church you know, made fun of Darwin, that his grandfather was an ape, and, and then they didn't bury him. But pretty soon, you know, 20, 30 years later, they did bury him in Westminster Miss, Abbey. and. Uh, so uh, repented what they what they had done and so on. So, but it shouldn't take 20 or 30 years, not to speak 400 years or whatever, uh, to until the religious people then adapt. So that would be the relationship. We take all three. The critical theorist takes all three things very seriously: theology or religion, and philosophy, <coughs> and science. And he takes seriously that there is really a progression of um, of the human species. But it is only repression when that what has been achieved in religion is also preserved in philosophy, that philosophy does not fall back behind religion, and that what has been uh, discovered in philosophy is also preserved then in science, because otherwise we have a horrible uh, impoverishment. Uh, the philosophy does not start with nothing. The philosophers stand on the, on the shoulders of the, of the theologians and the religious people, and also the scientists, their categories and so on, they are inherited from the philosophers, even from Aristotle and from Plato and so on. And if they become blind for the categories which they use all the time, then we have a real regression. So, I mean, I have sometimes students in sociology and there's a certain concept, you know, they have no idea where that comes from, or, or that even, even inside of the science. So, well, Kant, that, that doesn't, count, doesn't count for us anymore. And then suddenly Parsons. Parsons is also out and so on. You know, there is a thing in the New Testament where two people were cheating. They said to, to uh, Paul, uh, no, it was Peter, they said they sold all their goods because of communism at that time, and, and they lied. And so both of them get a heart attack and so on. And so the husband lies first, and then the, the other woman comes in, and she lies the same way. And so Peter says to her, the people who have carried out your husband are carrying you out as well. So you could say that those who bury people there, uh, and Kant is nothing, and Parsons is nothing, and so on, 
they will carry them out uh, pretty soon as well. So it is important that abstract negation and concrete negation, that this is separated. There is a negation going on, but not a negation which says, you know, religion is nonsense or philosophy is nonsense. And now we are the only ones who the first time... I mean, they were not all stupid there, from Plato to Aristotle and the Gautama and, and the, the Taoists and so on. They were all thinking people, and simply they, to have this stupid arrogance and sit there and say that was all these 6,000 years were nothing, and now we are coming, and the light, the sun was rising now. I mean, we cannot think of anything more stupid and ridiculous. So I think our professors and teachers have to, have to make that clear, you know, what the relationship is there. Yes, negation. Yes, science has really discovered things of which the philosophers could only dream. You could say this, you know. I mean, they, they dreamt of flying, and then the scientists came, these Wright brothers, and so on and so on, and then my Uncle Albin, you know, and they were sitting in these air channels and blowing around all the time and uh, formulating mathematical formulas a day and in and out, you know, I mean, the, the meaning of that, you know, didn't they, they had doubts, you know, that this whole damn fly, and so on. And they went up sometimes and crashed at the same time. So, I mean, to be a scientist is a very sacrificial type of a thing, you know, and it is anonymous. In the end, you don't even know my Uncle Alvin, you know. Who the hell knows who cut the wings backward? Who cares, you know? That means they go under in darkness, you know. They come out of darkness, and then sometimes you have a name, you know, Einstein or whatever. And then they don't even know, you know, what the hell he really was all about. That is nothing. I, I went to the haircut man today. He can't took me there, thanks be to God. And there is Einstein hanging there between all these little sex bombs all around there. Mm -hmm. So it's a real feast for the will to life, you know. But there I said, you know, why do you put that mass murderer there, right, among all these beautiful girls? And, uh, well, they, they didn't uh, know exactly that he was a mass murderer. Without him, there would be no Hiroshima or Nagasaki or all this thing now with Iran and whatever, and no bomb or have a bomb or whatever, so he he got, uh, you know, the, the initiated hell on earth. So, I mean, that they do too, the, the results uh, of science are ambiguous, you know, and uh, in many ways, they, they produced all the weapons. Fritz Harbour, I think we mentioned, you know, father of the gas war, and there's Einstein and the father of the atomic bomb, and, uh, you know, the, so it's, it's also a it's a wonderful history, you know, to be flying and so on, uh, or you boat or whatever, but it is also a very tragic type of history, what these guys have unleashed, and, and, and so at the same time. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that from the last time, that is an important thing that we know, what the relationship of theology or uh, religion and philosophy and science is, and the critical theorists are scientists, they are sociologists, they are psychologists, and that is fine. But at the same time, they are also very familiar with what they owe uh, to the philosophers and what they owe even to the theologians. What did it owe to Moses when Moses says no images of the absolute or no false names or no names for the absolute? And Moses didn't get that far as Kant did. And, so so, and, and, and of course, what people owe to Immanuel Kant, what the scientists owe, and what Habermas, what they owe to Habermas now because he brought some kind of a new paradigm into different sciences so uh, philosophers can help and uh, so I, I have that particular our sociology department I, I met uh, quite a lot of people who have this abstract negative attitude toward philosophy and sometimes toward religion as well and then sometimes the philosophers themselves are ashamed you know of being philosophers so they call themselves scientific philosophers that is the Vienna School, you know, and and, and Kopp, Kopp, what was the guy there in London there, Kopp, 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 whatever. Um, so uh, the, the, then they, they want to adapt to uh, philosophy, uh, uh, to science as much as possible, or they want to be a servant of science, so they, they prepare people here to go into behaviorism. So they prepare for them the logic which is then needed in behaviorism. So it becomes somehow philosophy is not the ancilla, the servant of theology, but it becomes the servant of science instead. They just got, one of them got $500,000 grant to find out, uh, you know, to fight against these people who abuse the, uh, the, the cyberspace cyber and, uh, you know, to, to take people and get them out of their money and their identity.
validity and so on, whatever. So now I don't know if that is exactly you know the function of a philosopher to do that, but you know, this, they thought it was, and and he accepted it, and he will work on this. There was a time when Fichte, for instance, recommended that the picture should be put into the passport, and other philosophers thought that is not the uh, that is not the task, you know. Of a philosopher to to make recommendations what uh, what is best for the police or whatever, and also Plato, you know, said that the people who have little babies they should move with their babies, they should walk up and down in order to make them happy or move back and forth and so. On. Now, is that really the task, you know, of a philosopher to do that, or what is the task of a philosopher? So that uh, you could say, you know, it's not to tell. Um, mothers, you know, that they should keep their babies in motion all the time. Oh, my daughter, uh, uh, Jeannie, she had three of them, oh, and she, when when they couldn't sleep at night, she put them in the car, and then she drove around New York until they were asleep or whatever. So she followed Plato without ever having heard of him or whatever. But Plato shows also what the, what the function of the philosopher is, which... Uh, should be superseded into science. Namely, his whole project of philosophy was to rescue the state of Athens, to organize the city-state in such a way that it would not be destroyed by civil society. That is when he, for instance, said that certain forms of music should not be played because that music made people into sophists and into bourgeois creeps and so on. And so that ego was not in control any longer. Remember what just happened? The guy, uh, 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 what is this? This guy in the music trial, loud music trial. There was this music coming out of the car, which is exactly the mu music which Plato wanted to repress, because it makes um, it makes uh, society uh, uh, anarchistic. Uh, it makes the ego anarchistic. It uh, uh, moves the id against the ego, so it loses control and so on. And other people, you know, are disciplined and pay highly for their being disciplined, you know, the assembly line or the officers. So suddenly they have a music which lets all that go, the, the counterpart of repression. That means to lift the repression up. And these people, you know, who had to pay so much that they would be, uh, would be disciplined, they become envious or become angry or whatever. And he was so damn it angry. See, one has to see when one uh, done was it, when one does this, you know, what happened before he was shooting. Before he was shooting, you know, he was already a guy who saw in these blacks and in this youth and so on a symbol of this anarchy, which uh, which uh, he maybe would like to be part of it. By the way, you know, sometimes we had a cardinal in uh, Archbishop in Vienna who fought against homosexuality and shouted from the pulpit and so on and so on until they found out the little altar boy whom he had himself. So it may be that the guy who shoots, you know, is very tempted by what is there and at the same time cannot let it happen. He must repress it and therefore shoots them. Instead of repressing his own it, he shoots the guys out there. And so if uh, So psychoanalysis would have to be introduced into the administration of justice, also for the jury system. Um, when I served, you know, in the court, I was jury, head of juries, and so then I always thought that uh, a jury system is a wonderful idea. It is of Christian origin uh, that, uh, you know, the, the people, people who are uh, accused that they have somebody who looks through their eyes. It's a beautiful solidarity idea and so on. But it doesn't help, you know, when people come in there with a certain personality. For instance, if you have a black boy, who, as I had it, who has supposed to have uh, 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 fortified a check, and then you have people in the jury who say, blacks are forging checks all the time. He is black. He forged a check, you see. And uh, so people have to become aware what role racism plays in the psychological apparatus of a certain class of people, namely of the fourth estate, whites. Whites who live in trailers and so on. And they have nothing below them, really. The whole society is above them. Everybody's doing better than they do. They all make the money. They worked a hard, long life, and this minimum wage didn't come to anything. And so they have a bad ego 
feeling in themselves, self-feeling. And so when they can see somebody who is worse off in the slums or whatever, and the, the black people were in there very often, well, they could be the Chicanos too, they could be anybody, but they are now here in Kalamazoo, they live on the north side, on Douglas Road, and so on. That is what consoles them then. It keeps their ego together. And when you take that away from them, and you say, no, this is a good boy there, or, or this black guy is in the White House, you know, it explains the, the unbelievable uh, hate, which I get sometimes, you know, even from my own family, hate against this Obama. I mean, where does that come from, this unearthly hate or whatever? It is that, that there must be somebody who is below so that one can feel good. By negating them, you elevate your ego. And if they take, you take that away from them, they fall into neurosis or even into psychosis. And then they can do those things uh, which Dunn does or which this other character did there, uh, this quasi-police fellow there in, mm -hmm. Sh uh, right, in, in Florida too. So, uh, and uh, there are many instances of that. So, <laughs> this, what we wanted to clarify the last time uh, is, you know, this uh, relationship of philosophy and science as we find it in Freud. We read that stuff of Freud, but then it comes up with Fromm again in relationship to Marcuse, who is very philosophical. Um, in, in Germany, Marcuse was criticized, even when I was in the Institute, when he was there, people in the Institute in Frankfurt criticized Marcuse because, not because he was a philosopher, but because he was the wrong philosopher, because he was too close to Heidegger. And uh, that, you know, that they thought he had studied under Heidegger. Then Heidegger didn't let him do his doctorate with him. With him. So Marcuse then went to Frankfurt and got his doctorate in, in the Frankfurt University and so on. But he took contact, made contact again uh, after the war with Heidegger and, and he wanted to do justice. And, and I think that is a good attitude, you know, even in spite of the fact that he was a Nazi and he died as a fascist and so on. Um, he was a great thinker. He had been a theologian, by the way. He taught theology before he studied, uh, taught philosophy. For many years, he uh, taught philosophy without producing anything until then time and being and so on came out, which really made him into a philosopher. But, um, so he had this whole background, and Horkheimer said, you know, Heidegger is a man who uh, read a lot but didn't think much, and, well, I mean, one has to be careful with this, right? And he obviously went off the track there with these speeches which he gave for National Socialism and so on. But in spite of all that, what may be wrong with him, it is possible that he saw something, you know, particularly as far as theology, is, uh, not as far as te technology is concerned. So he made statements, you know, about technology, which, which uh, uh, have to show deep insight, and, and there's nothing wrong that one has to learn from from them, and the same way Benjamin learned something from Carl Schmitt, right? So, um, and that's what we want to do today. We want to do look at that fascist stuff, you know. So uh, one cannot simply say, well, there's something wrong with Benjamin because he corresponded or whatever with Carl Schmitt, who was that art fascist or so, or Marcuse, you know, learned a lot and so and so. So we have to be careful there. Um, that means the critical theory is in communication with other opposing theories. They say this is the wrong theory. But that does not mean that one does not learn from it. So they also were not good Jews any longer, but they learned from Judaism nevertheless. They were not Christians, but they thought Christianity was in many ways superior to um, to Judaism, in spite of the fact that they couldn't accept the Trinity. And so neither of the Taoists, nor the Hindus, nor the Neoplatonists, and so on. So, so we have to become very differentiated in our thinking. Because when you are not dialectically trained, then it, you easily move into an extreme position and misunderstand something. Students continually misunderstand me when I, for instance, say, we do have to think dialectically too because positivism is not enough. So then they would write, well, you hate positivism and bad and so on. But we have to keep up. The American brain has to be trained in such a way that you can say, you know, Positivism is the philosophy of what is the case. They have, you know, developed tremendous methodologies in statistics and all this, which has to be appreciated. There's a tremendous work involved in, in, in all this, in this uh, 200 years or what of positivism. 
Um, and so what is wrong then? Well, what is wrong is that they stay with what is the case without transcending it. And that in the classroom looks that way, that West German professors of sociology go to East Germany and like to steal the chairs there and then teach their students. And these students then notice it. They say, why can't we talk about what should become of the society? How, can, how we can make it good or whatever. Then the positivity professor says, shut up, just you know, represent what is the case. That's all you have to do, you know, and not what ought to be the case, this whole damn dreaming stuff or that bloody hard liberal stuff and, and so on and so on. Just be a good positivist. Right? And then there is the struggle among the positivists because every new positivist discovers that the former positivist is still too metaphysical. So then court is still too metaphysical. And then Parsons is still too metaphysical. So then they, they strip themselves of that, the same heritage on which they feed at the same time, but unconsciously because they use all these, con these concepts, like cause and effect or probability and system and, and so on and so on. These things were all there before them, and they took them over, but uncritically, without we really know how they how they use that. And so, in that sense, I think this book there, about, where, where he talks about Marcuse, is not a very very good thing. It looks as if Fromm was angry <laughs> because Marcuse had become very popular, and we have that already before in the critique, you know, of Hegel's philosophy of right. So when Berlin. Uh, people said, you know, he has this mystical thing and he combines it with the sharp dialectics and then he has with this mystical thing, he attracts a lot of people, so he's very popular and everybody comes to him in his lectures and nobody comes to Schopenhauer in his classroom, he sits there with empty chairs and so on. And, and so then the suspicion is, you know, that this is not genuine, but it's just uh, hunting for popularity and so on. And, same thing with Fromm, you know, well, Fromm had his own popularity, but Marcuse, you know, was really topping the whole thing. He was the great guru. He fought against uh, Reagan there, you know, he gave speeches against Reagan in Paris, and he was at the head of the whole youth movement of Paris, which included also workers. It was also a worker movement at the same time. Um, and uh, so, and, and of course here... Hmm? And that was in the 60s. It was in the 60s, yeah. When Reagan right. was governor. Right, yeah, and then Marcuse died and he became become president, so, and then the catastrophe came out in 2008, uh, you know, when the whole economy collapsed because of this deregulation, because of Reagan shifting from, from uh, shifting to the Chicago school uh, to, uh, you know, and uh, deregulated everything and repressed the unions of the air controllers and, and all that stuff. Okay, so... But no, is there anything, any comment which you have about um, about what we did the last time, or you know this? I think that is a very important issue which we should. And Habermas is of course a philosopher, and he struggles. You know what the real function is of the philosopher, and and that is a, a fair thing. You know why, why one needs philosophers at the same time of the day, and um, I think one should learn that from Plato needs, um, in a certain sense, the philosopher is a psychoanalyst of a whole nation, or a whole civilization, and um, that is what the scientists may be suspicious about it. But then, you know, Freud does not stay with the psyche neither. He suddenly makes analysis of the whole civilization, you know, of, of the religions. He goes into art, Leonardo da Vinci, and so on and so on. So, uh, when he blames the philosophers, you know, that they spread all over the place, so did he. And that is why people have the suspicion that he also created something like a Weltanschauung, a worldview, and, and he did for many people, right? So, okay, now, we don't have to take uh, part, uh, you know, one against the other, so I think it's rather the dialectical approach which we have, which is very, very differentiated. The Jewish dialectics is even sharper than the Greek one, uh, but whatever we take, and, and that this, when we say dialectic, it does not mean that we despise the positivists of others. So they have to be careful in the American mind that this polarization sets in. When you say one thing is good and so on, then they think at the same time you said the other thing is bad or nothing and so on. 
so that we can and, and the concrete negation can help you to say yes we negated it but there was also something which we put, should preserve because if we don't preserve it we will be impoverished that goes to Khrushchev you know sitting in the UN and say we'll bury you socialists are not just burying that is the negation of capitalism they also have to learn from them they have to learn from the banking system all these complications which, which started in Milano and, and in, in Holland in Rotterdam and so on where they, you know, this is a very complicated system. When you, I mean, I taught, you know, in the Soviet area there, and in Rostock and so on, and went to the bank there, you don't know how pitiful these banks were in comparison to a bank in Kalamazoo, you know. So um, sometimes we don't appreciate what it takes to evolve a banking system which functions halfway, you know. So... And so instead of saying we bury you, you should say we want to want to go beyond you, and because we want to go beyond you, we have to learn from you. And therefore, we send people to get an MBA, you know, in Boston College or whatever, so that we can uh, better. And the same thing is with socialistic art, you know. If you don't learn from bourgeois art, music, and so on, your socialistic art will be horribly impoverished. And it may request behind bourgeois art. So what the bourgeoisie has done in music was is unbelievable. A Beethoven, or not to speak of a Mozart or whatever. Now, if you want to have suddenly that's bourgeois art. If you want to have socialistic art, you know, first of all, it cannot be done 50 years or whatever, but it has to grow like the bourgeois art grew, and it takes a long time, you know, to to do that. So. Some of the students in the 60s ha had a simplified view, you know, of the revolution which they wanted to wanted to make. So that is important that one, um, you know, learns from the philosophers, learns also from the religious people, in spite of the fact that one says, you know, we have left philosophy behind and we have left religion behind. Uh, if you leave it all behind without any residual, you will be impoverished, and you cannot simply start from nothing. Um, but it always presupposes something. Can you not? Does there not become at some point a a, a point where you've moved so far beyond that you you lose some ability right. to actually yeah. conceive of? What, I mean, if we have yeah. this process, we lead to science. At some mm -hmm. point, are we do we have problems going back to religion and going? Right. I mean, we can see some philosophical underpinning, but it, right. is there not a weakness involved? Yeah, in I mean, you can study? see, you know, Freud, for instance. What does he do? I mean, he takes the Oedipus complex, the Elitor complex, the all myth, you know. Uh, so he takes this myth because they can express something which he cannot express yet in scientific language. But it is very well possible that he will be able to do that and leaves those uh, residuals behind. That's possible. And so uh, with Habermas as well, you know, to the postcular society, you know, um, he simply sees, you know, that at the moment, you know, religion is not dead or it has not disappeared. And why does it? Ha why has magic disappeared and religion has not disappeared? Because magic has been replaced adequately by technology, but religion has not been adequately uh, replaced by science because science cannot speak about the extra everyday life world experiences when they break into human life. When you get your message, you know that you have brain tumor or or your divorce, or your family falls apart, or whatever. Um, they have pushed it into art, so somehow, you know, artists, uh, poets, and so on, like uh, um, whoever, uh, have taken over that. And, and the same thing is true for religion, you know. It's not these philosophers who go to the graveside and, and bury people and bless them or whatever. So it's religious people who still do that, you know. And I think I gave you the example of that of that poet there in, in Zurich who uh, a secular, totally secular man who wanted to have his coffin to stand for 10 minutes in the cathedral and the priest allowed that to happen, you know. So uh, it, there is an embarrassment in modern people because they don't know how to end things. Not only to end their lives but also to end their stories. So Brecht had how many endings of his thing the, uh, about his story about Chicago or so. And John, yeah, and, and so, and, and we mentioned also in Chicago itself, when you go on the Chicago River and you look at the skyscrapers, they have no ending. 
So you have 150 stories, and you can put another 150 on top of it, or whatever, if it's as meaningless as it is already on 150 levels. So uh, suddenly they put a cathedral on it, a Gothic cathedral, or an Athenian temple, or whatever. Look what's on top of those buildings, you know. That is the embarrassment of, of a modern person, right? So, but it is possible for Habermas that someday philosophy, uh, no, science rather, um, can, or philosophy, can find, uh, uh, the, the vocabulary, can find the semantics, can find the, the words in order to do what now only religion can do. So where now religion is still uh, uh, expressing the aspirations of people for peace or for liberty or whatever, where they mobilize their own humanistic potential and so on, they cannot be replaced by science or by philosophy. So, but it is possible, you know, he says yet, this little word yet is important. So we could, it could be possible, you know. So could we make the argument then that this is sort of what Marxist vision is, that once the people realize their own potential within themselves and unify in that way, then religion sort of washes away? Or even yeah. what Marcuse argues, yeah. you know, with, uh, Marcuse argues with death is that, you know, the problem we have with death is the idea that people haven't lived a proper life, not right, that death right, is actually... Yeah. Well, these are attempts to do that, you know, so... Marcuse has a little chapter on on the uh, on on these all these heretics of the late Middle Ages, you know the uh, the brothers of the common life and the brothers of spirit and so on. And they all had very revolutionary ideas, you know, and uh, that goes up to the priests who oppose fascism, you know. That goes to the liberation theologians who were killed by the Arena Party in in, in uh, El Salvador and so on. So um, uh, Marcuse. When he wrote the Hegel book, you know, Re Reason and Revolution, uh, he left out Hegel's philosophy of religion completely. And Tillich was horribly upset and wrote an article, you know, in this in the journal for social research. They had their own journal and protested against Marcuse, you know. But then later on, it, it, it changed somewhat, you know, and became appreciative of Thomas Münzer. That block had been so that there were um, there were revolutionary thoughts in those religious people which modern philosophy and science has not caught with yet. And as far as this is true, then liberation theologians cannot yet be, repla cannot be replaced yet by philosophy or science. Because, but it's possible that philosophy and science will develop, you know, a logic and so on, in which they can do that. And in that sense, you know, what, from, uh, what Marx said about religion will wither away and the state will wither away and the family will wither away, to some extent, you know, Marx sometimes made these exaggerations, and they were not to, are not to be understood literally. Uh, so when he says, for instance, I want to have a society in which I can walk in the morning, then write poetry, and then work in the field, or whatever, he, you know, to do away with the division of labor. He could never seriously think that the division of labor could be removed. That would lead us back to the chimpanzees and so on. So that was not his idea, but it was the idea that all sides of our being, our senses, our ears, and our touch, and, and our intellect, and our dialectics, and our analytical understanding, and so that all that should be uh, developed. Now, but that cannot possibly touch the objective division of labor. We would all starve to death. So what they do in China, you know, is they say to a professor, okay, now four weeks or eight weeks, you go to the farm, you know, and you feed cows there, and then you can go back to your mathematics and so on. So then when he is on the field, he uses his hands, which he doesn't do as a mathematician, and he uses his eyes and his smell and uh, his hands and legs and so on. So that way it can be done. You know, it's a, uh, Marx gave some kind of a parable or an image, you know, what it ought to be like. But it must not be understood literally now that we could have a society in which we would, in which everybody would do everything again. Because that's what it was, you know. So the the, um, the civil society developed out of the family, and in the family they made shoes and they baked bread and and all of this, you know. So then came the division of labor, which characterized civil society. Now we cannot go back behind the bread factories or whatever. We have to we have to construct the bread factories in such a way that the full realization of man is possible.
And that is what you see in the kibbutz, which have been developed by socialists from Russia and elsewhere, you know, where they say, okay, we feed the kibbutz by glass factory. And I looked at those glass factories. So they could uh, produce 10,000 windows in a month. But they say, no, we just produce half of it. 5,000, because we want to have time for photography, for dancing, for writing poetry, and so on. So that way you can do it. So the, the emphasis is on those people who do the photography and do all this so that they can develop all these sides and that one is not so horribly one-sided and becomes a caricature of uh, a human being. So that is why already in his Abitur uh, uh, essay, you know, Marx said, that the, and then we come into civil society and then we become greedy and so on, and then we are the only human being, which uh, only being in nature which cannot fulfill its destiny and so on. So that is the, the yeah. But um, with this withering away, you know, of state and so on, that also, I think, cannot be, t or of the family and so on, uh, a withering away, if it is understood in terms of abstract negation, you know, it would really be wrong. But if it is in a concrete negation, then it means that another family system has to be developed, which will not be patriarchal, you know. And, and so on, whatever the modification. And I, early on, I wrote something about Hegel's philosophy of the family, and I was the only one who had done that since after Hegel. Nobody had ever mentioned his philosophy of the family, and I was in Amsterdam, and I gave a talk on that. And then, in the meantime, in the 80s, then some people in Belgium uh, wrote something about his uh, about his philosophy of the family. So, so he, Hegel shows, you know, the ideal of the family as it had been the case in the Western civilization. But at the same time, you know, now a new time came and it had to be had to be modified. So I had some chapters on the future of the family. And the same thing is true also for religion. When um, when Bloch, you know, t uh, talked in about the future there in Leipzig in the university, the students asked him if religion would still be there. That's a Marxist question. Or will religion wither away in the free society? And Bloch said. No, it will still be there. It will have a function. And its function will be that people will not fall back into the old idolatry of uh, commodity fetishism and so on. And the students didn't like it. He, you know, they, they threw him out. And he went to, uh, to Germany, West Germany, um, because, because of that. So the West Germans, you know, accepted him, particularly theologians, uh, made it possible for him to publish all his stuff at that time. Okay, so, uh, very good. Is there any other question about um, this thing there, about what we had, did the last time before we go on there? Okay, we have our test today. It's back there, so we will have our second test after the break. That means on March 12 to March 19. Uh, I think other classes decided that somehow that they wanted not to do anything before the break anymore. They were exhausted, so... We'll take these dates, then so on March 12th we can start, and you can do it the same way again. I give you some questions, you can use that, or you can concentrate on the guy uh, whom you have chosen as your depth study. You can take the same guy, so when you have Habermas, you can go on with Habermas. If you chose, you know, uh, Hannes, then you can take him, or if you chose somebody else, you can do that too. Okay, um, then uh, we have, uh, by the way, we couldn't have our lecture on, on Francis Pope there last Monday, so we have to postpone it for the next one. And the church people, they want us to do another one. So we will not go out next time, but we will go out uh, afterwards. Two more. That is okay. Yeah, well, two more, yeah, because we didn't have that. So is that okay with you? Uh, yeah, certainly. Okay. So, and you are always invited to come to that uh, if you want to. Um, then um, we go to have a visit tomorrow morning. We go to the cathedral there. Father Martin will be our man there. He's a Jew who converted to Protestantism, then he converted to Catholicism, and we'll talk ab about you know religion in modern society, his religion. He is also the guy who annuls people's marriages, which is an adjustment of Catholicism to the modern world. On one side, they think there should be no divorce because of what Jesus taught. Uh, on the other hand, uh, two-thirds of the people are divorced, so 
um, they found a way in between, which means your marriage never took place, which in it itself unbelievably ambiguous, and one of my daughters would never take that chance because she said, I was married, you know, 17 years, and we had three children, so how can I annul this, you know, it, it has happened, so on. But one has to see, you know, what, uh, what a bind the religious community is. They want to remain faithful to what they call the Word of God, which they have no right to change. And on the other side, you know, the people who are there and, uh, and, and uh, are really divorced, what to do about this now, and annulment is this thing which uh, doesn't satisfy the real orthodox and which doesn't find the modern people neither. So here we see how ambiguous the relationship is between religion and the secular modern society, and there are many instances. So um, you have always been invited, you know, for these things. We will go to the Muslims then uh, four weeks later, and uh, uh, so we are always invited for this. Um, okay, what else do we have? Um, yeah, if, if anybody's interested, I, I have this online course. It's already filling up very nicely. I think we have already 20 or whatever people there, and uh, oh, that's on the psychological elements, um, so in which we do further what we did here, there. Um, but Paul uh, just emphasized the psychology thing there. Okay, uh, so then contemporary issues. Uh, is there something which we should discuss? We always wanted to start out with this. Um, there is, of course, something going on. I mean, that's very simple to find that. You just turn on the television and then see what the anchor man, what he focuses on, and sometimes that's worthwhile. So now, t uh, tonight, what do we have? Kiev, right? Kiev is burning all over the place, and <coughs> Orthodox priests are singing in the middle of the flames. And so <coughs> our task would be, you know, first of all, describing it's going on for weeks now, a month or whatever, um, and we can describe, you know, phenomenologically what we see, you know, the f burning f cars and houses and I think 29 people dead and uh, hundreds of people wounded in the whole struggle. We see, you know, the police and we see the army um, using heavy weapons in order to get people down. So that's the phenomenological level, but that would not be enough for us critical theorists, right? We have to look at it dialectically in terms of dialectics of finitude as Hegel calls that. So what is the antagonism which is present there? What is the problem? What is the conflict there? And uh, that is not so easy to uh, see. Um, photography is really helpful. And there was a time in the Enlightenment when we thought, you know, that photography would really bring about the truth and if you see those pictures, then you have the truth. And uh, <coughs> in the meantime, we know that these pictures can be transformed, they can be manipulated, and so on. It was a great disappointment, you know. But a little bit is true still. I mean, it is uh, it is some, some worth to see these pictures if you ask who shows it to you and why does he show it to you. I learned that very early in the gymnasium there, you know, that there are intentions behind everything and to, and to look for these intentions uh, because they are not so obvious uh, very often so you have to think a lot you know to see what that is so and uh, you can use your machine there and you can take CNN you know so you have a middle position then you can take that MB and C or whatever and you have a very left wing position the black uh, anchorman and then you have to go to the right you know Fox News and then you have that radio clown there uh, on the right the there, hood. yeah. So, um, so they, th that's all what you get. That's the range you, you have. That is the right, you know. That is some other center, and then you have this guy on the left. So, but if you turn on channel 137, then you have international news, news, you know, and then you suddenly get the Russian picture of it, and you get the Norwegian picture of it. Also, wonderful movies. Eh? have become addicted to that, you know, at night at nine o'clock to I have a Norwegian detective thing or a Danish one and uh, enjoy tremendously, uh, you know, the landscape and the language and, uh, and the similarities of these Germanic languages and then also Italian movies and French at the same time. So nevertheless, politically, you'll see that they show maybe the same pictures 
but they have another text to it, you know, or they even show other sides of the same picture and so on. So all that, you know, for uh, what the critical theorist, the task is to translate things into the clear text. Uh, that is technically called the clear text. Everybody in Europe knows what the clear text is. But um, here it is not so used, you know, that word, because we think that this text which appears is clear enough, <laughs> that it may be a very unclear text that you have to translate first into clear text. That is the issue. So now, uh, and that means, you know, that in order to see the pictures, you have to have thoughts. And um, these pictures prevent you from thinking. So you have to turn it off then and have to stop it and then you have to put your own thought process going and um, have to bring categories in now and, and see, you know, if you want to think dialectically what antagonism is, is there at work <laughs> and what is at work is, you know, the, of the government of course but then you have the whole Ukraine which was part of the Soviet Union uh, separated itself in terms of uh, nationalism. Uh, the, um, also, part of them had already fought with uh, Hitler, uh, particularly the Western part. There were Ukrainian divisions, um, members of the Ukrainian Liberation Army, as that was called, uh, you know, uh, administered the concentration camps, and uh, so uh, they have that background, the same background which uh, Croatia has uh, too. Um, so they were part of it, were Islamic people. The Islamic people in Kiev were very much pro-Soviet Union and defended Russia against the German invasion. And But on the, uh, the peninsula there, um, you had Islamic people who joined the German Liberation Army um, and uh, so were then punished. Well, they say Stalin didn't punish them, but he uh, settled them, resettled them in the Caucasus. Uh, on the theory that uh, traditions can stay alive only if they have external markers. So if you have uh, Ukrainian, if you have an Islamic tradition, you need the mosque there, uh, then, and, and what is done in the mosque, and then what's done in the minaret, and uh, the uh, calls of the uh, imam, or whatever. Uh, so if you take that away, if you take the cultural landscape away, and, and also the natural landscape, put them somewhere else, these uh, traditions will uh, will disappear. Um, uh, that was too optimistic. It doesn't disappear at all, but they came back after the death of Stalin, and so you have them there. So you have other splits there between in the side of the orthodoxy. So when civil society returned, and we played a role these 12 years we went there, we supported really those people who wanted to go with the West or where open for the West, my student Tatiana and uh, student Alexandra and, and so on, they were all pro-Western, they studied in the West sometimes and so on, so we we were part of it, so we took part of it by just going there, you know, symbolically and it was for me when I went there the first time 12 years ago, you know, I came to Kiev and it was a horrible type of experience you know, the, the uh, Lufthansa had built already and they see the influence, you know Lufthansa had built a new airport in Kiev, and uh, beside the new airport there was a little one, a Russian one, which was a miserable one. In the meantime, they also replaced that, so you see there's tremendous uh, investment uh, going on from the West, so that plays an important role there. And also the machines on the field, the old Russian things with the curtains inside, they all disappeared, and new airplanes, you know, from the West were, were there. When they Airbus and, and, and American machines and so on. So uh, there was a strong influence of that. So when I came the first time, it was horrifying in a certain sense. So first in in Germany in Frankfurt, I said, "Where do I go from Kiev?" They said, "Nowhere. There is nothing behind Kiev. It's just wilderness." I said, "It was wilderness." I said, "I have to go to 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 Yalta. How do I get to Yalta? We don't know. I have no idea how to get to Yalta." So. I come then to uh, you know to Kiev and there the world ends. That is also important. The world ends there. So um, and I went to a hotel downtown. They were they met today. They they were in in the main main sphere of Kiev. There is a huge plaza where people can move, and they moved already at that time 
with flags and they were singing loud and like they did tonight. Uh, there wasn't so much fire or whatever. It was it was not so wild as it was tonight. But nevertheless, I came to the hotel. It was late at night, and I had a letter from Tatiana, my Washington. Dad. I said, "Here's the letter, the letter of recommendation. Can you accommodate me?" And so, "Oh, what is this? It's written in Russian. You must be a Russian. Is she your girlfriend?" And so, now I said, "She's my student." Well, the same thing. So, what do you want? I said, "I just want to stay overnight." And she uh, said, "No, we have no place. If you want to stay, you have to pay double." I had to pay double. And so I stayed then. And uh, in the middle of the night, I wanted to go to the toilet there. So I went out, and there was the whole Ukrainian army was laying on the floors there with their machine guns and snoring and sleeping there. So I had to climb over all these people to get to the toilet out there. I came back at 5 o'clock in the morning. I had to climb over them again. And with a taxi, I went to the airport, which is about 30 miles and after 10 miles, suddenly a tank comes out of the bushes, you know, and stops, and I have to show my thing there in the middle of it. I mean, it's still dark, November. So then, uh, okay, they said, okay. Then I went on, and suddenly the police comes out of the bushes and stop again. Finally, I came to the airport. 7 o'clock, the machine should go to Simferopol, uh, which is on the way to Yalta. So, um, uh, well, it wasn't this, it wasn't that airport. It was another one. Where is it? Well, next door. So I went over next door, and then it was closed. Then I knock at the door, and there comes the old little grandmother there comes out. They sleep in their offices. They slept in their office. So they said, what do you want? I said, I want to go to the Fairport. Well, plane has canceled for three weeks. It doesn't fly for three weeks. I said, what should I do in the three weeks? Well, there's another airport, you know, on the other side of the Nyepa River. Nyepa River is the next one to the Volga. And uh, there, this, it was full of blood there for months and, uh, when the Germans were there. So, um, okay, I went to the other airport. They had no toilets. It doesn't know what, what that means. The, the, the Adam and Eve toilets, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then they said, well, yes, they, we, we fly one, but not when it rains. Not when it rains. I said, well, when does it stop raining? Who knows? That's <laughs> it. Was, it was just catastrophic, you know. So I waited for hours and hours, and it rained for hours and hours. So finally I gave up. I just went to my hotel. I never reached the Zimperopol. I sent my paper to Yalta instead of myself, and I said, this is a chaos. I can't do it. So, so I stayed a week. I stayed in, um, in, uh, uh, in, in Kiev, and so it was a good hotel there, Hotel Moscow, and... Uh, I um, there the girls were sitting there at night, you know, waiting for the customers. There with these fishnet uh, socks on. There, I mean, seventeen year old, fifteen. Under the Soviets, you know, prostitution was not allowed. So, uh, they caught a prostitute in a foreigner hotel. They put her into the mines. She had to work. Uh, had to, to, was punished with five years hard labor. And the German prisoners who were Ill- illegally there put in there too for that work. They met them all down there. So. Uh, they were very tough on it, but now you know to to see you now post socialistic time now they uh, you know all these fat German businessmen came in there and picked them up, and so on it was that pitiful, pitiful situation. so I witnessed all that stuff in the meantime, they sell Ukrainian women. I had one here I had uh, you know uh, one in my department down there she got married here and moved out and Virginia? Yeah, Virginia. but they are really endangered species, you know. That trade goes on. You can buy them in the Frankfurt airport, you know, and then you can marry them. And if you don't like them, you throw them out. And when you throw them out, they fall back into prostitution. They have no way to go home anymore. We have here. We have some in town where businessmen, you know, went there and bought them and bought them here. And some of them do work. They married them, and the marriage just lasts, has lasted. So, Gore Lake out there, there are a few. We saw those. So. Um, remember that one night in Yalta when we went swimming? Too? Yeah.
in the meantime, he has disappeared, and this has never been taken up, but that was the plan. But tonight, when I heard these priests singing there, they sing beautifully. They have these deep baritone uh, sounds, you know, and they sing the national anthem, and, and so on. So, and we had the priests and the bishops in our course there, too, who try to bring, you know, to turn the clock back. So, which does not really, uh, they, they let them talk, but what that shows, that tonight they were in the picture, shows that the church has re-entered the public sphere again. They were not totally out. Stalin, you know, put in the Patriarch of Moscow, you know, he appointed him, so they were somewhat there, but very much controlled. Now they are in the, uh, you know, they have entered the public sphere again, because that is the public sphere between uh, civil society and the state. It's in between, and they want to influence the legislature and the executive and so on. The press belongs there, the radio, but also these protest movements, they all belong into the public sphere. And obviously, the religion is present there. So, nevertheless, the, um, uh, they separated themselves. They gave up the atomic bomb, Ukraine, Kiev, so they didn't want to have the bomb anymore. They, they delivered it. Um, and uh, not the other 12 uh, uh, members of the Russian Federation. They all have bombs. And that is a very bad situation for us because our plan was, uh, it was 10 minutes before 12 there in terms of the atomic clock, uh, to one, one strike on Moscow, a massive strike, would have paralyzed the whole defense system of the Soviet Union because it was all concentrated in Moscow. But then uh, when the uh, neoliberal counter-revolution uh, was, was successful, they distributed, and all these capitals now of the 12th, they all have their own atomic weaponry. So today, if we want to defend ourselves, we have to strike at all 12 of them at the same time, which makes it much more difficult than it was ever before. But Ukraine is outside of that. So Ukraine has the, is a harbor uh, near Yalta there, uh, a harbor which the Germans bombed to pieces with a big cannon. The Vastapol, they pulled the big cannon from Germany, you know, pulled it all these thousands of miles there, and then shut this whole town to pieces. That's where the Russian fleet is still situated. And then there is another harbor where the Ukrainian fleet is, so there are still military things there. So in this situation now, there is a split between the eastern part of the Ukraine and the western part. And the eastern part uh, is uh, has mines of all kinds, gold mines, coal mines, and so on. So that's the richer part. And that richer part wants to join, join the, uh, the Russian Federation. And the western part, closer to Belarus and also to Poland, they would like to be members of the European Federation, the European Union. So, um, and both of them pay. So um, the Russian Federation offered them money, the Ukraine. They said something tonight as if the Russians had withdrawn that money. I don't know what, what that really means, but also the they've what? reduced how much hmm? they've reduced how much they were going to give. Oh, they to reduced them or it. Okay, yeah. Them. So, but we don't know what that really means. But the, then the European Federation also also paid them, and uh, how much the CIA is uh, this is going on for years and years already. So the last uh, president is in prison in the Ukraine. The next one they want to put into prison, and so. It is a very unstable system, and it has something to do with this East and West thing, where to go. So the sympathies, you know, among those people who came to the last 12 years, I think there were many who were, were sympathetic to going to the West and become, uh, you know, uh, members of the European Union. From a Russian point of view, this is deadly, because when you have the Ukraine as a member of the European Union and of the NATO and so on, you reach practically behind Moscow. That was the German plan, you see, to go through Stalingrad and through Kursk. Kursk is almost a little bit more eastern than Moscow, and then you have an encirclement. So the Ukraine is felt as an encirclement of the Russian Federation, and therefore the Russian cannot possibly want that the Ukraine will go to to the European Union, and so the eastern part doesn't want that neither. And uh, now the present government took some steps which were more in sympathy to that eastern thing, and those who rebel are those who would like to go to the west. So that is the present constellation. So our president and today I think also the foreign minister of France in Germany are visiting 
uh, Kiev. So the airport is far out of the city, so you can land there and, uh, you know, whatever goes on in the city, uh, you are relatively safe out there, So except when the tanks come out of the bushes. So, uh, Presuppositions when you want to j join the European Union, yeah. they would have to. It would take years and years. So yeah. one of them is that you, you can't have any debt. Right. That's why yeah. Greece right. took the book, yeah. you know, with debt, and then they got yeah. in, and then right. it was revealed that they had massive yeah, they, debt. The Greeks bought a derivative from Wall Street, which then mm -hmm. blew up, and uh, so they were suddenly in, and uh, the preconditions were all returning. There. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in order to, for Ukraine to have no debt, it would mean yeah. you know basically a structural adjustment program. Yeah. So pitiful already, Dustin and I, we went to that university there in Regents in yeah. Paraphol and so um, it is some kind of an unhappy atmosphere. We, uh, for s several years I went to a hotel at the airport which was from the Stalinistic time. You couldn't think of something sadder, you know, in terms of architecture and so upkeep and so on. Hotel Moscow? Yeah. Right there in, in no, that's more, uh, that's more okay, the Moscow the, the Hotel, that's a little bit better. But there was one at the airport, you know, which was a leftover of this Stalinistic period, and it was so horribly sad, you know. Yeah. And and the students don't feel good in all of this. Uh, they uh, they have this, I mean, many of them have that longing, you know, for the West. Uh, Alexander went to Pisa in Italy, you know, and, and studied there, and and, uh, and and Chenia was very unhappy there when, when I took her out, and um, her grandfather was made an experiment by the Mengele people in the concentration camps and his sister and the sister died in the experiment. They were put into a basement in cold water and then they wanted to find out how much of a coldness they could stand and the sister died and the boy survived it, the grandfather, and he was very grateful, you know, when I took Virginia out and uh, so, I mean, I always saw that as making something good, you know, of the bad things which were done to them, but the bad things go on, which are done to them. That is the, uh, the horrible thing. So well, there's that that one time in Orianda in the front there. There were yeah. those three girls that saw me walking by, and they yuhooed to me, and mm. you know, and yuhoo American boy. It's the way we walk, apparently. <laughs> That's what you always say, right? <laughs> and um, and you know, it was actually two women who were in their forties, uh, and one was uh, twenty something. And and we talked for a long time, and then she said, well, we're going to go dancing, you want to go dancing? And I said, no, no, no I'm going to have to be in the conference tomorrow, I don't want to go dancing. And they're like, well, do you want to go to drink? And I was like, no, I don't want to drink. And they're, they're like, well, do you smoke? And I said, well, I just had a Cuban cigar, so I'm not, you know what I mean, going to ruin that with a cigarette or something, you know. <laughs> and then they're like, well, do you like sex? So like, yeah, of course. And then they all got, out, got up and said, okay, but come on, let's go. And I was like, what? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, but, you know, and asking, trying to figure out what, they're, what they wanted, and they said that if, if I were to get them pregnant, being an American, it would be easier for them to go to the U.S. Mm. because they had no opportunities in Ukraine. All the men were in. Poland. 
Oh, right, that's what they see all the time. And I have no education. There's nothing yeah. there. And I was like, right. So you want me to impregnate you? <laughs> but that, but that was the hopeless situation that you see. There right, it is. Yeah. Constantly. And so our uh, translator and so the Alexandra, but also the fellow, the the, the man, you know, where just torn to pieces about that government and their politics and so on. So there's uh, deep discontent, you know, on all kinds of sides. And it's very hard, very often, to analyze, you know, and to sort it out, really, what is where and, and so on. So, um, okay, so we want to see, you know, just what one can do in terms of time diagnosis and, uh, as we call that, and, and time uh, prognosis and, and, and by taking a particular case and, and uh, you know, analyze it. So now where, where that ends, you know, and how far it comes, they remain great riddles, of course, that's part of the analysis that one cannot explain all of it. It has to reveal itself in time. So, But one can make some observations, you know, about those, why are these priests there, on which side are they really, you know, and, and uh, which is not entirely clear to me where they are now. They we had them in the course, and they were very orthodox. I mean, very uh, almost fundamentalist in terms of uh, the patristics, the Greek and Roman Church fathers. And uh, in an unmitigated way, you know, they delivered that to our meeting there. And they were secular people, and but they somehow were willing to tolerate that. I don't think they will accept it in any way, but they were willing to let the priests talk, or the, you know, they had suffered enough and let them talk, but I don't think they, they were of the same spirit there. There were all those professors who had been trained in Boston here and so represented the American side, so we I think we made great investments there to, to get them on, on the European side and on our side, and so, so obviously now we hope that it's not the same thing will what will happen in Yugoslavia, and I went there for five years into that civil war, and it was just horrifying, and I knew the role which the Pope played in the whole thing, the Vatican, and knew the role which the Germans played, but I didn't know the CIA role, and the American role was amazing, you know. The whole thing was maybe the most powerful role in bringing the country apart. If that is true also now in, uh, in there, we just can't see on the surface for a moment. We would need some evidence, you know, concrete, and they're hiding it. Okay, so that was one, one thing. Is there anything else? Uh, um, contemporary issues. Uh, okay. I had something here, but we, we don't have to do that. We just uh, see if I have something else which may be of interest. And if you have something, you can tell me. Uh, I wonder if we could take a break for a second. You want to take a break? Okay, you take a break. Yeah. Come with me. I, I plan on going. If you go, if your oh. you know kids don't protest too loud, will. <laughs> I'll go again. Will. I like Ukraine. I had to learn Russian just to deal with the Ukrainian, so you would be you wouldn't be get yelled at anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and got well, in I mean, it, I hope they will settle it peacefully, but for how long, you know? Yeah. to have uh, several of those. Maybe you can start with them. What time is it? It's 
just after 8 o'clock. Okay, so you still have. Mm -hmm. uh, right, how much? Uh, how long does it go? Nine? Nine. Nine? Nine, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we take the secretary first there. That's very oh. shortly. We don't have the, the, the whole thing. Yeah. The secretary there from Munich, uh, just to get an impression of it, but mm -hmm. I have to get there first. So let me just do a few things before we start with this. Yeah. Very good. No problem. In the meantime, have your cookies, have your water. Enjoy yourself. Did I tell you I talked to one of Malcolm's best friends? Who? One of Malcolm X's best friends called me. Oh, really? Last week. Wonderful. Peter Bailey was his name. Oh. He just published his memoirs. But uh, he's not selling it to Amazon or anything, so you have to buy it directly from him. Really? But, uh, Sounds like water. Yeah. Sounds exactly. like all water. Well, he protests the big, the big um, publishers. Because he doesn't want to do it for money, but then he knows if he does it with an academic publisher, it doesn't ever go anywhere. And all buys it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he does it on his own. Well, they try to free him down. Well, he right. can try, you know. But, um... He lived with him or knew him or well, he was one of the founding members of the OAAU, the organization of Afro American Unity. Mm. That was one of the two organizations that Malcolm founded after he left the NOI. Yeah. That was the secular one. And he was the editor of his newsletter, the Black Lash. Mm -hmm. So and is he black himself? Yeah. Oh. And uh, he's a journalist. And um he was there in the Audubon Ballroom when Malcolm was killed. He was one of the pallbearers. Mm. And so uh, he knew him quite well, you know. And okay. So he called me to talk about the book project and his book. And so and I invited him to, if he wanted to write something for it, but yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Can we continue? So we uh, we had our uh, issues there. I had another thing which we can think about at uh, some time, and that is education. I have a report, you know, about Baltimore where I was a teacher for three years in uh, Loyola College and another uh, college and but um, th there is a report from teachers who are beaten up in the classroom and uh, Karen knows about this, Karen is a wonderful teacher in the elementary school so and what teachers go through and suffer and then there is something about uh, what Obama wants to do particularly in order to give pos possibilities to black people uh, young youngsters, black youngsters, so to give them opportunity, which is part, you know, still of the Roosevelt um, idea. They they are honest in that they do want to get people, you know, out of the slums and go through you know, Western Michigan University and then, you know, join the middle class and, and so on. So uh, sometimes we can talk about it because uh, the critical theory was very much um, concerned with education and remained that way they um, specifically it was you know how can we educate in such a way that Auschwitz will not become happen again so how can you overcome racism and the rabbis are very very pessimistic you cannot do anything about it, it always comes back again you know it's just a fate which uh, we have and, but I mean that should not be the last word about this so and um, the Frankfurt School thought about making movies in which you show what a prejudiced person is and how one can overcome prejudices and, and so on. So, but we don't want to do that tonight, but if you find something about that, you can think about it. So, um, then as far as reading is concerned, uh, we want to uh, take as the official reading required the Siebert's philosophy of, uh, Hegel's philosophy of history, because that is a good background. I think it is clear that we cannot understand uh, the Frankfurt School, nor from, nor Habermas, nor Harnett, and so on, without having in mind, you know, Kant and, and Schelling and Fichte and Hegel and uh, and particularly that new Hegelian logic, dialectics and so on, which makes it a little bit difficult, you know, for our culture and civilization to understand that because we have repressed it. We have repressed Marx, we have repressed Freud to a large extent, we have repressed dialectics because we thought it would destabilize the country more than the economy has done already. So these are all things we, we have to take into consideration when we think of ourselves because when we do the discourse it also helps our self-knowledge who we are which is not very easy to 
grasp that, uh, in what context we are in, and so on, to be honest about this. Um, so not simply to say my best friends are Jews or my best friends are blacks or whatever. So we have all these dirty tricks how to get around those things. So now it would be particularly the first um, chapter there, which has something to do with the right and left antagonism, which, which plays a role. <coughs> so um, I can just sum it up very shortly, and then you can take the second chapter, the third one. The whole structure is what we just discussed today. So uh, the uh, Hegel's philosophy of history has a theological part, it has a philosophical, humanistic part, and has a scientific part. So um, Hegel takes all these three things together. He is open for all three of them insofar as they make a contribution. So when you think of his idea of history, remember the uh, thing there, roadmap, the roadmap, there we have these different categories. So we have the family, we have civil society, we have the state. And so this book is about one of these categories, namely history, which includes all the previous ones, because it all this becomes more complicated as it moves on, more differentiated. So Hegel still has this idea, this mystical idea, that reason governs the world. That comes from the Greeks. And then that providence governs the world. That comes from the Hippos. So Hegel still combines Jerusalem and Athens and Rome. These are the seedbed, what Parsons call the seedbed societies of our civilization. We are wing civilization of the European civilization. And so are the people in Kiev and, and in, in Moscow and so on. So, um, and then uh, he, that is A there, reason governs the world and so on, which is mystical, as they say today, and um, we said already at his time. And uh, then he has this B there, which means the human, uh, the purpose of reason. So when you say reason governs the world, then reason has a purpose, and the purpose is that realm of freedom. And for Hegel, it's the realm of freedom of man and of God, Freedom does not only mean the freedom of choice to what toilet paper I want to buy, but freedom as absence of alienation. So it is the idea of having a realm in which people will not be alienated. Or in a positive way, freedom means to come home to oneself in solidarity with the others. That's the freedom of being, which is the basis for the freedom of choice. <clears throat> if you have no freedom of being and are alienated, then the freedom of choice in the marketplace and you buy the toilet paper, is really uh, determined. That means the market analyst knows exactly the toilet paper, lila or whatever, blue, which the housewives will buy. So they run on, on, on a track in a certain sense. They put little Tchaikovsky music to, to it, and then they all run in there and buy the toilet paper and come home and have no money and a lot of toilet paper and so on. So it's all predictable, like elections are predictable. So, and the freedom of being is missing, the freedom of choice is an illusion. And the science can discover the illusionary character and knows how can they know exactly which, country, which state will vote for whom or whatever months before it happens. Okay. And so on, if these people would really be free. So, uh, if we are the free world or not, <coughs> would uh, depend on how much alienation we have. <coughs> so if we have an alienation between the genders, for instance, as we do, the alienation between the races still going on, alienation between the classes, class warfare, politics of envy, which you hear words which you hear every day, and so on. So these are all forms of alienation, alienation from the environment, uh, that we have no rel relationship to the to the squirrels and to the frogs and to to the birds and so on. We we cannot really see them in their predicament. So like Schelling could way had the feeling that these little sparrows do look sad. They are not smiling. They are not really happy. They they know their limits and cannot get beyond the limits. So the idea that they suffer from privation, privation Schelling calls that, uh, that means they know that they are deprived because they cannot transcend their environments as we described it before. So, <coughs> no, let's see, um, uh, so, so that is A, a reason governs the world and so on. B is, there is a goal to the historical process, and that is this realm of freedom, this realm of absence of alienation, this realm of being one with oneself in one's autonomy, but through 
solidarity. And we said already that the uh, American and the Slavic world who have moved into the foreground have that task to reconcile what was never reconciled before, namely to reconcile the solidarity, universal solidarity, which means, uh, which means uh, uh, remembering solidarity with the victims of the past, the slaves, the feudal lords, the works, the serfs, serfs and, and uh, wage laborers, and also uh, uh, present, you know, with the uh, slums on the other side of the way, old station, I just we drove a little bit through it today, and um, then a uh, proleptic type of uh, future-oriented uh, solidarity, what will happen to our children when this and this goes on? Will they be in the totally administered society? Will they have to face another war and, and so on? Or will they go to alternative future number three, in which this reconciliation between autonomy and solidarity would be accomplished? Traditional societies were solidarity. They had solidarity. And modern society has autonomy, and I think other societies never had but nobody got it together. So it would be the task of the American world and the Slavic world to come about this reconciliation. <laughs> so you can test that day and day. So if they, for instance, reject food stamps, that means there is a lack of solidarity. If they reject uh, health care for all Americans, that re is a rejection of solidarity. If, you, uh, if they reject the minimum wage or whatever, then that is a rejection. So you know exactly where we stand, you know. Um, if the Russians suddenly have something like uh, are against gays or whatever, or make a law against gay, what does that mean? It means that the Orthodox ca Catholics got into the public sphere again and were able to, to influence the legislation. And uh, so the Soviets also had a negative attitude toward, uh, uh, toward homosexuality, and as we, we did 50 years ago and so on. So but uh, we have made that step forward, you know, to a gay marriage and so on, and the Russians are refusing this and so on. So one could read that as a, as a lack of uh, autonomy in a certain sense, you know, because we say, you know, everybody has the right to get married, equal rights, equal marriage rights and so on, which they are at the moment not uh, following us. So there's a difference between the two. So, uh, nevertheless, the, uh, for, for Hegel, then we have under, under B there, this goal, there is a way how this goal has to be reached, and there comes the middle term, logically, for Hegel. But he wants to explain the means are the agents of change. So, agents of change can be nations or classes or individuals or the great world historical individuals, uh, Hegel himself saw Napoleon, you know, the great world individual riding through Jena after the Jena Auerstedt battle, which he won. So the French occupied uh, uh, Jena, and um, Hegel had to flee, and he had his uh, phenomenology of spirit he had it in his pocket, and otherwise the French would have burned it or whatever. So, and then he went to Würzburg, fled to Würzburg, was a journalist in the newspaper, and then he went to Nuremberg and became the head of a, a gymnasium, humanistic gymnasium for nine years. So that was Hegel's. Hegel was in contact once with a world historical uh, fellow, um, Napoleon, and of course Napoleon, you know, was also, he marched with 800, 900,000 men to Moscow, Hitler marched with 3 million men to Moscow, both of them killed a lot of people, um, Napoleon was looked down upon, uh, as Hitler was looked down upon, and after 50 years, 60 years, they buried him in Notre Dame, so brought him back from the island. And, um, and uh, something similar may happen to Hitler, I'm afraid. Uh, as you see the whole literature there, you have all the books sitting there, and from one book to the other, suddenly Hitler's a human being, we also have to be a human being. <laughs> so slowly, they will look different, and as most people forget about it, they will get him, you know, in a certain place. So Stalin smelled the rat, so therefore they wanted to make sure that nothing of him was left and they tracked that box with his bone and some bone of his wife and the Goebbels and his wife and the children. It was traveled all over the place. It went to Moscow and back to the German Republic and then it was buried in the garage. You know when you have the car there's a hole under the car that you call from below that they put it in there and cemented it in there. The, that's where it is now and nobody knows exactly where it is. So in order to make, uh, you know, not to develop any cult, 
like it happened with Napoleon. Everybody goes to Napoleon's grave now, and <laughs> the um, Hitler's pants in, uh, in Austria, their grave has never been vandalized and is nicely taken care of. And so uh, somehow that took the place of some kind of a cult. But um, so we will see what will happen. But uh, you know, the, there are movies coming out continually, and they look more and more sympathetic than you know and the Germans like it and so they don't like the judges who uh, sentenced the Auschwitz people my cousin was a judge in Frankfurt Auschwitz trial and he got gray hairs in two years not only because of what he heard about the crimes which were committed but also the Germans who said how can you do that as a good German to uh, sentence you know your own German brothers in the name of the allies and so on and so on so poor Pasek he just died a few years ago and um, it was a hard time for him. The Jewish so, memorial is right on the site of the bunker. Yeah. With all the big stone blocks in the middle of Berlin. That's right on the site of the bunker. And yeah. then Hannah Arndt struck oh, the Hitler's right bunker over. there, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. and then right on the other side. It's on the hotel or on the parking lot now, right? Or yeah, what? and then right where the entrance would be. <laughs> oh, bunker, yeah. It's a parking lot. Yeah. But underneath, they left it as it was, right? They didn't destroy the structures underneath. Yeah, it's still there. Parts of it were destroyed, but... Yeah. Uh, a lot of the tunnels were destroyed. Yeah, a lot of the tunnels were still there. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so these are the agents of change, and um, Hegel knew that that is where the most terrible things are happening, and where it was hardest, you know, to find uh, the mirroring of providence or whatever, because of the horrible cruelty. So in history nations behave toward each other as individuals wouldn't do it anymore because individuals are under administration of justice but there is no administration of justice for the nations we can do you know in, Flo in uh, Vietnam or whatever uh, wh whatever we can do nobody can throw us out we are simply too powerful that anybody ha happens so it's might is right in, in the historical process and there is where Hegel and Schopenhauer agree with each other the description of the slaughter bench of history and of the Golgotha of history they have in common, where Hitler, where Hegel then becomes the uh, you know the accursed optimist, as um, as, as uh, Schopenhauer said, that is when he introduces when he refers back to the beginning. Reason governs the world, so even here we have riddles, but we should not you know sit on these riddles, but we should make an effort. And so you cannot be inductive anymore to go from the individual to the universal, but you have to go back to the beginning and start with the universal reason governs the world of the Greek state and the, the hippos and, and so on. And then you can maybe, uh, it makes sense to you that these are uh, these horrible facts can be instruments of providence to bring about the ultimate uh, realm. That, that is what Schopenhauer uh, called uh, cursed optimism, but this curbed optimism is among the Greeks and it's among the Hippos too. So, um, when you read Re Jeremiah, for instance, you'll see that uh, Jeremiah uh, prophesies to the king of Judah, uh, you know, you have to surrender to the Babylonians, you know, otherwise you'll all be slaughtered. And then suddenly the Egyptian army appears at the horizon and uh, Nebuchadnezzar withdraws his troops, you know. And then come the false prophets, come say and say, oh, Jeremiah was wrong, and so on. He's a traitor, you know. He wants us to surrender to the Babylonians. There, the Egyptians are coming, and they are helping us, you know. No, Jeremiah says, don't depend on the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians are really withdrawing. Nebuchadnezzar comes back again, and and so the, you see the uh, what God is doing. He uses, he uses the Babylonians to punish the Jews because of their idolatry, because they pray to Baal and to other gods in the neighborhood. So, therefore, they are punished, and, and uh, you have to take that punishment, uh, Jeremiah says. So go with them into Babylon, and then you will return after 70 years and so on. And uh, so the optimistic prophets are the wrong ones. He, the pessimistic prophet, is the right one. But when Schopenhauer says the Jews lie, it's not only that they lied about little things, you know, Sodom or whatever, but lying means this to go to Yahweh and say, this chaos there, the Babylonians and the Egyptians, the Jews and, and so on, and using one to punish the other and then use the other again, then he uses the Persian, Cyrus, you know, in order to uh, overcome the Babylonians. Babylon, Babylon falls to, to Cyrus without any battle whatsoever. 
So, so the, the guy who punishes is then punished for what he has done himself. And behind all that, Yahweh is standing. And this Yahweh, who does all that in order to bring about the kingdom of Yahweh, uh, the kingdom of God, that is the optimistic part. That gives meaning to history, which Schopenhauer thinks is a lie. So the attack on Hegel is at the same time the attack on the Jewish catechism, on the Christian catechism, and on the Islamic catechism. They all have this optimism in common. So let me repeat again. What is the optimism? The optimism is that the slaughter bench has a meaning. That's it. And that is so unbelievable after Auschwitz. And that is the horror, that's the struggle of the Frankfurt School. That's the struggle of uh, before Auschwitz already, you know, but uh, particularly after Auschwitz. Um, it is just uh, uh, superhuman. It is just that grasping, you know. So that is the idea that the Hegelian system has broken down and so on, you know, citing the Schopenhauer and so on. And not only, you know, Horkheimer and so on, we don't, Thomas Mann cites with Schopenhauer and so does Hitler and so does uh, Goebbels and so on. So suddenly, after Schopenhauer had been a dead dog for 50 years, suddenly he becomes alive again, uh, very much so, uh, as the bourgeoisie loses its optimism in the First World War, 10 million dead, Second World War, 70 million dead, and the third one, never knows when, and, and so on. So um, that uh, all these things hang together. So then, uh, for Hegel, the, these agents of change, they have a material in which they transform things. The material is the system then. That is what Parsons and so on worked out then. They didn't want to know anything about evolution anymore, but it was the system. Uh, that's the whole Parsonian structure functionalism is devoted to that. So that is the family then, that's civil society, that's the culture, that is the state, and so on, as Parsons has it. And so that is what the agent of change is transforming. And then comes C. C means the evolutionary process. So first there is, you know, just communism, and then one is free, the king in Africa or in Asia or in Persia, and then if you are free, that is then Greek democracy, and that is then feudal system, and that's capitalism. If you are free, and then there is the Christian utopia that all will be free. That all will be free only when the particularity of the nation states is overcome, because the particularity of the nation it's a negation. That means I am an American, I am not a Russian. We are Americans, we are not Mexicans. We are Americans, we are not Europeans. And so this not, this negation, leads in the extreme case to war, but it is there as tensions, and you can see these tensions, you know, to, to Putin and so on all day long, you know, we are not them. Or also on the right here, we are not Europeans. You know, Obamacare, that's the European thing. We are not doing it the European way and so on. So you have different levels of this, we are not them. They are the others. The others, that is the negative out there. So therefore, in the extreme case, then you have to kill the others. <laughs> okay, so the, this, uh, what we do here is, when we say we are the free world, we take a utopia, the Christian utopia, the freedom of all, and transform it into an ideology, which then justifies the freedom of the few. Maybe the 1% we talk about all the time, right? The 1% who control whatever, 60%, 70% of the wealth or so, this 1%. In the meantime, you know, they, they concentrate on that 1%, they get angry about it, and then you see how the anchor men control themselves. Now, let's not so concentrate on this one. That doesn't lead us, you know. That's just envy and so on. So, um, so then they forget about the 1%. But, you know, for a moment, the one that comes up, the income is horrendously out of range to the income of the government with the min minimum wage, you know, which is 870 and maybe should be $10, and then the other guy makes $10 million a month or whatever. So, um, uh, but we don't want to talk about this too much because that could go in the right direction. You take them out, the 1%. Why should the 99% not take the 1% out? It's ridiculous that 1% controls the whole shebang there. So, um, and th this tempting thought there has then to be neutralized again. And you can see how they do this, on the left even, and in the center, and on the right. So, now that is what this chapter is about, right, the right. Now, very shortly, um, this right and left came about, first of all, in the uh, French Revolution. So there, suddenly, there was the right, which was the high bourgeoisie, 
and the left was the low bourgeoisie, and the fourth estate was not present at all. Now, the, the high bourgeoisie, the bankers and the industrialists, wanted to have a constitutional monarch. They wanted to, the French king to be the same like the British king had become already in the 17th century uh, when, when they developed a constitutional monarchy. And it was the left, the, uh, the low bourgeoisie, the later Hitler people, who wanted to him guillotined. So he was guillotined and the Green and the Dauphin uh, were guillotined. Right? So, <coughs> but then all what they did, the constitution which they created was all for the third estate. So therefore the fourth estate began to rebel right away, 17, uh, 1731. Uh, the first time, then 1848, and then 1917 in Hamburg and Munich, and then in Petersburg, and so on. And they don't stop, of course. You know, If somebody talks about Marx or doesn't talk about Marx, the reality decides, namely that there is a fourth estate which is not taken care of, namely that we have not even a fourth estate party, which everybody else has, by the way, in the meantime. We don't have the Labour Party. Would it make a difference? Yes. I think we would not have the rejection of food stamps with the Labour Party, we would not have, you know, not giving people uh, uh, unemployment compensation with the Labour Party. We would not have uh, this minimum minimum wage struggle with uh, with the Labour Party. That means even an unrevolutionary Labour Party, like the British Labour Party, the Social Democracy in Denmark, Norway, and Germany, and so on, they don't want to have a revolution. They want to tax the one percent out of their shoes there in order then to, uh, like the mayor in New York wants to do now, he wants to tax the 1% by $900 a year, and with these $900 a year he wants to feed the schools down there, and build up the schools and so on. That's social democracy. What, are, what a revolutionary thing hmm? to do, right? Hmm? India is reacted to as though it's such a revolutionary thing to no, do. No, no, it's it's not revolutionary, no, I mean... But, but from the other side of the, the political spectrum, yeah. they see a, a tax right. of $900 yeah. to people yeah. who make That's billions right. as something which is but unfathomable. You know? But it is it is legitimate uh, Roosevelt liberalism, you know. Uh, I mean, for better or for worse. I mean, I think for us it is a real progressive thing. But the social democrats have given up, you know, the idea of this realm of freedom. That's utopian, and so they think with technology improves and... Uh, through negotiations and worker councils, uh, so they, you have to think that in Europe they all have worker self-determination, which we don't have here. We have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, owning groups in these corporations with no workers' representation whatsoever. So it's not only we have no labor party, we have no, uh, no uh, workers' representation in all the main committees in the factory, so that the worker does not co-determine what is done with his surplus value, which he has produced. That is all, all in the hand of the owners. So, and, and, uh, and so the, the owners give it to the, uh, the uh, you know, the administrators. They're the, what do they call the, uh, um, well, there's one for trade and one for commerce and one for production and, and so on. So they have all delegated it. So the more you become a capitalist, the more you move out Today I looked at my pension there with Katya. Somebody came, you know, representative of uh, the university people there and their retirement thing and so on. So on. I asked all the time, who, who the hell makes these decisions? You know, for instance, they, what what Western pays for my uh, retirement there, they distribute that. And the last time they wanted to have particularly small uh, owners to whom they wanted to give that. So. And now they cut some of them out and don't give it to them anymore, and they give to others the double. And I said, who the hell makes this decision? And he said, well, we hired a firm, and so on and so on. But, and I said, is it the firm? No, the firm doesn't make the decision neither, but there's some ghostly type of a guy who makes all these decisions, you know, to do that. And then I wanted to see the whole logic of the whole thing. And it is logical in a certain sense, you know. First of all, they, what Wall Street has to do is to give capital so that people can expand. So they want these small guys to expand. And so therefore they shift my money there to these small guys. If they don't do well, they just kill them off. We'll throw the whole money and put it to somebody else. So, but I don't know exactly the guy who does this, you know. This is like the Deus Absconditus, you know, like the hidden god. They are sitting there behind and cannot be seen. 
Okay, nevertheless, the uh, right and left now. So that was the National Assembly who made the Constitution and so on. They were right and left. And then it was a religious thing. The people on the right thought that the whole Quran, the whole old, uh, the whole Hebrew Bible and New Testament were all myths. Uh, we're all history. We're all history on the right. You still hear that today, you know, when, you, when people preach or so. And then on the left, they thought it was all myth. That went to the extreme around 1900 that Jesus had never lived, and Mohammed maybe neither. So they all were, that was a myth which the community produced for itself. Now today, nobody says that anymore. In the meantime, I think almost everybody thinks that Jesus was a real person, a historical person. So, but there was a moment where the left went to that extreme. So, And then there is a middle like King and so on, who has said, okay, we have to admit some of it is myth, you know. Jesus has been mythologized to a large extent, but there are also historical events on the other side. So we have both of them. Okay, so that is the meaning of right and left. It can mean something religious, it can mean something political. With us now, it is very strange here, it is all fixed and frozen. So uh, continue repetition from day to day to day, they talk about the right, and the right that is the uh, neoliberals, who are not neo, but they are old liberals of the 18th and 19th century. And then we have the Roosevelt liberals, these are the liberals of the 20th century. The difference is that the Roosevelt liberals uh, somehow modified, socially modified liberalism by saying, yes, autonomy, initiative, and all this, but there are limits to it, and then we have to bring in um, solidarity or s subsidiarity. That was the main thing, subsidiarity. So the individual should do what he can do, and the family should help him. If they cannot do it, then the state has to come in, and the federation has to come in, or the world society. That is the principle of subsidiarity, which you find uh, in Obama and all these uh, uh, Roosevelt people up to today. So that is what it means for us right and left, and this chapter will in enlighten you a little bit about this, and then the rest of the book shows, you know, this theological dimension A, which we have lost in our civilization, so we know something about ourselves then. Then there is B, about the goal and meaning of history, we have lost that too. Uh, so the humanists still have that, but we don't, you know, the culture as such doesn't have. But what we have is where you become scientific, we can study this agent of change, we can study Napoleon, we can study Lenin and so on. That's all in the empirical realm. We can also study that what they wanted to change. That means the system, what they did about the family, what they did about civil society, a creation of the expropriateurs in, in St. Petersburg and so on. All that can be studied. And we can also have an empirical um, idea of the evolution of the human species. Uh, but we wouldn't say any more uh, uh, freedom of one, freedom of the few, freedom of all. So that's too qualitative, so we make it then quantitative. So we say uh, more or less. So if you take Parsons' evolutionary theory, which the students enforced on him, forced him to develop in the 60s. So there you have also that communistic thing, but then you have the, uh, the primitive society uh, first, and then you have the archaic society, and you have the uh, historical intermediate society, and you have the modern society. Socialism and so on still belongs to the modern society, and Parsons thinks it will go on for 200 years. And um, it's, uh, the whole progress is made in terms of differentiation. So he thinks we will go on for another 200 years because we can continue to differentiate the family from civil society, particularly civil society and the state, particularly the state and history, so all this history and, and culture that can all be more differentiated. And for this we need more time. And that is why we will go uh, this way. But what comes later, he does not know about Parsons. So the first uh, the primitive society, uh, there the family and the religion play an important role. In the archaic society, we have then added to it kingship comes in. And then in the historical and immediate society, we have the constitutional monarchs and so on. And, um, and then in the modern society, the economic subsystem moves into the foreground. So we have the family and religion first, then we have uh, the uh, po political sphere coming to the foreground, and then with us today, the economic thing is in the foreground, family is weakened, state is weakened, 
the economy determines everything what we are doing. <coughs> so that is the, that is the Parsonian thing, which is also Spencer, Spencer thing, you know, Spencer's idea of social Darwinism, but in a refined form. So <coughs> he had worked for 30 years uh, on the system uh, theory, and then the student said, but why does it move? And then he added this evolutionary theory to it uh, in a Darwinistic, but a refined Darwinistic way. <laughs> okay, so that would be the first chapter, and then choose uh, your own uh, thing again, your own depth study. You can take the same thing which you did. If you wrote about a guy from or whatever, you can continue this, then take another book by him. You can stay with the same author. You can also t move to another one. And in the test, you can either write on that one author or you can answer these uh, these questions. And so we have the same thing. Okay, now um, what we want to do is uh, uh, to take one thing out, namely the critical theory uh, in uh, relationship to other theories, uh, other social theories. And um, that was one of our themes here. Um, so let me go through that very fast. We, we are clear now, I, I hope, about the history of the Frankfurt School, about the structure of the Frankfurt School, and uh, and certain persons in it, and the consequence, and so on. That was our first point. Then the central notions of the critical theory you find on your roadmap, under A. So there you have all these categories, civil society, state, and so on. Uh, then we had a, 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 prob a thing here about political ideals. Um, there is Habermas, the second generation, uh, grow up under Nazism, fascism, suddenly meet those Horkheimer and Adorno and become aware of uh, the ideals of Western liberalism and are very fascinating by it and become the second and the third Hanif, the third generation in that, uh, um, uh, in that movement. And then uh, there are, is a point of uh, uh, the civilizing achievements, um, so they were particularly fascinating by the civilizing achievement, particularly of the United States. What did we achieve? Well, there was the Marshall Plan, you know, and then there was the uh, Nuremberg trial and the Tokyo trials. That means we promoted international law, and that people who initiate wars uh, are responsible for it and have to be tried for it. Unfortunately, we didn't apply it to ourselves, otherwise we would have to send the push to Den Haag, which we haven't done and we will probably not do. So these are the, the achievements, and on them then come also the, um, the disappointments about the um, whole thing when the United States uh, unilaterally started this Af Afghan war and the Iraq war, and they became, I think they never lost their love for the United States. Hannes, uh, you know, taught here in Columbia University and Habermas in Northwestern and so on. So they remain sympathetic, but they are sad. They are sad because we betray our own civilizing achievements and our own political ideals. That is the point. So, but it does not develop into any hostility against the United States. It's just sad. And the same thing is with the state of Israel. They remain loyal to the state of Israel. They are very much aware of the horrible crimes the Germans committed. They are for that Germans paid billions of uh, marks and euros and so on, and, and so on. They all think that's justified, but they're also sad how the Israelis behave toward the Hamas people and uh, Lebanon and, and so on, Hezbollah and so on, and their prisoners at home and the breaking of UN resolutions and all the sad things which the state of Israel does unfortunately. So then we come to that point which we want to go to tonight there very shortly and we can continue that the next time and that is competing theories. So and the main competing theory was National Socialism of course. It was uh, National Socialism rose against historical materialism and the critical theory rose against fascism and they cannot be understood without understanding this fascist thing. And so what we want to do today is to get a few movies there. We cannot see them all, and you can see them for yourself, maybe, but we want to discuss maybe a few minutes in each of them. And the first one would be the secretary of Hitler there, so that we go, you know, start with the most simple level of the chambermaid, as Hegel calls it, chambermaid level, 
when you are you're below and you peek through a hole and look into world history. Okay, Dustin, who can do this? Uh, put that lady up there. Yeah. Where is she? She's, she's a she's there already. Okay, so we can put this over there. I don't need it anymore. So, and we want to discuss that right away as it is there. Um, and we have still nice time for this. Okay, the first one. The first one is. Um, it was 20 years old, I think, when Hitler asked, you know, to that he needed some secretaries, and so his um, assistants and some fourth girls in who could like good typists, and so they came to him and he tried them out, uh, you know, to listen to them how fast they could type, um, and uh, it shows Hitler's human side. He had a very fatherly attitude and very friendly to them and understood their panic, uh, you know, so that they suddenly were in a new environment. And so it shows this human side, but at the same time it also gives an inkling of the other side, namely, she said at a certain point to the wife of Hitler, you know, he is so nice and friendly and so on, but then suddenly he becomes icy and is frightful and so on. And uh, his wife, Hitler's wife, said yes when he becomes the Führer, when he becomes the leader. So when he shifts from the family and the environment and so on, shifts to the state and the, uh, the history, he becomes another person. That's her. As an old lady, I think she may have died in the meantime. Can we make her talk? So she speaks the southern dialect, Bavarian dialect, very similar to Hitler's own dialect. Yeah. 